How many of you, at least once this last week, while you were reading or watching the news, have felt sick to your stomach? Two votes. Almost every day. Almost every day. Have you heard the recordings of the children yeah, yeah, crying yeah. and screaming? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, unbearable. Have you seen the pictures? The, yes. Have you seen the one of the, the mother yeah. untying her two-year-old shoes? Yes. How did that make you feel? Well, sad? You know. You're, you Very know. Sad. Angry? Yeah. yeah. Angry. Sad. Enraged? Really? It's a P word. <laughs> All of the above. Determined? Yes. yes. All right. Do me a favor. Remember what you felt this week. Keep that with you. If for some reason you were not already 100% committed to opposing the Trump administration, if you needed a little bit more to get you going, there it is. This summer or this fall, if you're unsure, if you find yourself someday sitting at home and you're, you're really not sure if you want to go out and knock on doors, think about those children. If you get an opportunity to do a phone bank or a postcard campaign, think about those children. You'll say yes. Today, Donald Trump signed an executive order. Phony. At, at least on, on paper, it at least says it reverses the policy that he implemented, the policy of ripping children apart from their families and throwing them in jail. He did not do this out of the goodness of his shriveled heart. <laughs> he doesn't have a heart. No, he did it because of us. He did it because we screamed at the top of our lungs. He did it because we fought tooth and nail. The sheer volume of outrage that I've seen and heard over the last couple of weeks, it, is, I, I, it blew me away. I can't remember anything like it, not even since Trump has been elected. We donated money, we posted online, and most importantly, we called our members of Congress. And eventually, finally, the message got through and the administration knew they had to do at least something. It's a symbolic victory, but honestly, it is a victory. This is a man whose entire brand is built on never apologizing, never backing down, no matter how ridiculous of a position he's in. But our passion, our numbers, and our commitment to basic human dignity forced him to relent. Now we must not relent. We can't let our guard down, we can't stop, not right now. It's really important that we keep going and double down on this. <clears throat> the new policy is not somehow now decent or humane. It's not. There's a lot of problems with that executive order. First of all, um, it's, it's unclear. It, like all of Trump's executive orders, it looks like they put about 12 minutes of thought into what to put into it. It doesn't come up with a tangible plan for reuniting children with its families. It doesn't end the policy of indefinite detention, which is uh, probably against American law. <laughs> and it doesn't, um, it doesn't end the ridiculous, draconian, zero tolerance policy that started this mess mm -hmm. in the first place. In fact, Trump's entire approach to immigration has been an absolute travesty from day one. We need to keep up the intensity of these last two weeks. We need to fight even harder. And honestly, I think this woke us up a little bit. Yeah. I, maybe it's just me, but yeah. it felt like some of the energy had been flagging. Felt like uh, we were getting a little complacent, maybe getting a little tired of everything. I can't blame you, but it felt like there was definitely, definitely people falling asleep here. Comment, please. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. So um, before coming here, you know, probably like a lot of people, uh, I watched too much political. Um, and uh, like probably a lot of people here, what can you do? You know, so I, you know, gotta donate time, gotta donate money, you know, gotta donate action. And so I've been donating to all the Democratic uh, emails that come in, and you can send money, and it's all Democratic. I've actually started donating money to the ACLU because yeah. they're doing some of these causes. Yeah. But it's like, where can I donate? You know, this thing was just so horrific. I mean, just tearing at my guts, and anybody who I thought had a heart would, you know, fall over. Well, on the news, as before we left, they had a website. Uh, there's a woman who, from California who has a Facebook site who was trying to raise some money for uh, bail. 
and she wanted to raise $1,500. Yeah. Yeah. The rices? Yeah. The rices. So she raised $15 million. 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 Great. And so, it's still growing. Uh, right. but, and what the money is going into is to rices, R-A-I-C-E-S. I haven't looked it up yet. I, they're representatives, but as you see, all the news channels are always up down here in the Texas border. So if you're looking to donate money directly to this particular cause, and they, uh, their representatives are saying that they're going to share money with like organizations to filter as much legal support out there for the mothers and the fathers and the children who are no longer representative because the federal government cut off funding for children who are came across the border. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it's like one of those things that I think if we share information like we've been doing since day one, you know, that might be a thing that somebody might take and share to somebody. Well, that's actually a great example of this. See, we were, I think we were falling asleep and that woke us up. To our credit, the plight of these children has us fired up and ready to go again. It has reminded us who we are and who we're dealing with. Because we are dealing with people who want nothing more than to kick the most vulnerable among us while they're down. The, if you're an American citizen or an immigrant, as long as you're not rich enough to fight back, they want to kick you. We're dealing with the same people who tried and failed so many times last year to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Yep. And guess what? They're doing it again. Yes. Yep. This week's House budget proposal that was unveiled, it includes provisions that would slash a half a trillion dollars from Medicare and a trillion and a half from Medicaid. So two trillion total from those programs. So if you're a senior, if you're low income, they're kicking you. They're also gonna try to use the budget reconciliation process again to try to end Medicaid expansion. So that's another kick. They're gonna kick 12 million people out of the healthcare system if they get their way. So that's another reason we can't, we can't stop, we can't relent. We need to be calling our representatives, our members of Congress constantly. Call them weekly, call them daily if you can. That's what we need to do to, to, to fight back against this. But honestly, the only way this madness is actually going to stop is if we make sure that Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan or whatever Trump stooge they get to replace Paul Ryan when he retires. We need to make sure that they lose control of Congress after November. Yes. 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 Taking control of Congress, oh, I'll get some questions in, the, in a minute. Taking control of Congress needs to be our guiding mission, our number one principle in life for the next five months. The good news is now that the primaries are over here in California, we kind of have an idea who we're fighting for now. Down in Modesto, Josh Harder is taking on Congressman Jeff Denham. Jeff Denham presents himself as a moderate, but he still voted to, to end the ACA. He still voted to cut rich people's taxes. He likes to kick as much as any of them do. He's moderate today. No, no, he's, he's not, a, not really a moderate. Uh, over to the east of us, Jessica Morris is going to be taking on Congressman Tom McClintock. Yep. And yeah. McClintock, if you don't know him, is a man who can pretty much be called upon yeah. to take the worst position on any given issue yes. at any given time. And right here in the Sacramento suburbs, Congressman Ami Berra is defending a blue district against a Republican challenger whose name is, I honestly don't remember, but who cares, let's beat him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, with Andrew, Andrew something, so he's, he's, he's going down. Um, every morning when we wake up, we need to be thinking about the children, the families, and the feeling that we had this week. And then we need to think about what we can do, what we can do to help Josh, and Jessica and Congressman Barrow win their elections. We need to get them in power and give them the tools to kick back. But Barrow had a, a barbecue this weekend, yeah. at which I went to, and you know, and there's a fee and stuff, and it was interesting. But there were only about forty people there, which surprised the heck out of me. Well, one one thing we have this week, we do have uh, someone from uh, Congressman Barrow's campaign who's going to be talking about uh, some Sam? ways to get involved. <laughs> uh, there you go. Okay. Oh no, no, he's right there. It's John. John. <laughs> So, so actually, what's on tap for this meeting? Um, after uh, after we get started here, we have a presentation from Andrew Kim from an, or Andrew Truman Kim from an organization called Flip the Fourteen. And there, he's going to tell us about how we can take back Congress. Then after that, we're going to have a discussion of some things that are going at the state on, at the state capitol. Unfortunately, we got some bad news about one of our bills today. We're going to hear a little bit more about California Way Team because if you haven't heard about them by now, then 
we're going to make sure that we do everything to get you out that we can. And then we have, uh, uh, well, we have the representative from the Bear campaign, and then we'll be talking about some upcoming events. So before we get started with our guests, um, I had a question. No, it was a comment. Several months ago, we had somebody say that um, because Ryan and McConnell were the leaders, that we could actually send messages to them? Yes. All right. Watching Paul Ryan right now, I'm a past psychotherapist by trade. His, his energy is so low right now. Yeah. And if we can make Paul Ryan more and more ineffective, that's helpful. So I would say start writing. Tell anybody you can, write. Bombard Paul Ryan's office. And, and he'll be really ineffective after he's no longer the yeah. Speaker of the House. <laughs> Absolutely, but we still got. I know, we do. Eight more months. We do. Uh, seven more months. I'd like then, to add to that. Oh, sure. If you do write to Paul Ryan, you will want to write contact Speaker of the House. Okay. He has to accept every email that comes through. If you go through his website, he will only accept constituents. Oh, uh, yes. Actually, there are two spots when you Google email Ryan. Yeah. There's the constituent email, and yeah. then there's the non-constituent. Speaker of the House, so you can send an email to him as right. nationally. And the same thing with McConnell. And one one more question before we get started here: Is anyone anyone new here who hasn't been to one of our meetings before? Who wanted to? There we go. Um, and, and this is totally voluntary. But if any of you wanted to, you know, just uh, introduce yourself and, and real quick, just uh, say what motivated you to come join us. If you're interested, if you're not, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. That's okay. We're, we're glad that you're here. Yeah. I'm here because my poker game was called off. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. hopefully we're saving you some money, right? And I'm here with my wife and her friend, our friend. Well, welcome. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Good. Um, I'm here. I'm just back from college. Uh, and this is my mom, I think most of you know her. Uh, she's the one who annoyingly has her phone out the whole time. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm here uh, because I'm very passionate about these issues and um, I'm very passionate about being in defiance to people who I perceive as uh, that are infringing on basic human rights. Great, thank you for coming on and thank you for your technical help this evening. All right, so without, oh, do we have another, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. The reason I'm here is I heard this thing on, on the internet that said, what would you do if you were alive during when Germany was taking the Nazi from Germany. And what you're doing now is what, would, is what you would have been doing then. So you've got to do something. I've been thinking about that so much. I, yeah. Honestly, I think about all. when years from now when this is all over, mm -hmm. what do I want to tell my grandkids I was yeah. doing at this time? Exactly. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for sharing. So without further ado, I will introduce our featured guest this evening. He is from an organization called Flip the 14. His name is Andrew Truman Kim. A couple months ago at our Indivisible Leadership Conference, he gave a presentation on uh, how we can get rid of the 14 Republican House of Representatives members from California, and it was awesome. I came away thinking that we would beat all 14 of them no problem. So hopefully we'll all have that same energy tonight after we hear from Andrew. Andrew, thank you. I'll manage expectations a little bit. We're going to be talking about field plans. And in the context of taking out all 14, the data looks good. So um, just quick background. Um, I've been a congressional staffer, both myself and Donald Lathbury, for close to 10 years. Um, I was also campaign manager for Congressman John Garamendi in 2014, when it was considered a frontline uh, campaign, where the Republican Party uh, NRA dropped five to ten million dollars, and it was it was tough, and that's why the work being done for Ami Bear is going to make a difference. Every vote makes a difference. We're talking about um, voter deficit about fifteen hundred, so it's very important. With that, um, let's start off with a quick survey of the room, just so we have an idea who's here. Who has done phone banking before? Oh, excellent. Who has done door to door knocking before? Excellent. Who has um, written a postcard? 
Ooh, excellent. How about who who's seen uh, TV ads this cycle? <laughs> okay. How about mailers? Who's received at least five pieces of mail? Okay. And how about digital ads? Who's received a Facebook message or a Facebook ad? Oh yeah. So in the DCCC, these are the six points of persuasion of what professional campaigns use to convert voters. Um, let's do a quick poll on how you guys feel. Um, who thinks phone banking is the most effective? Raise your hand. Who thinks postcarding is the most effective? How about who thinks TV is the most effective? How about mailers the most effective? How about digital? How about door-to-door -door knocking? Correct answer, round of applause everybody. Trick question, the reason why door-to-door -door is the most important because it's the most personal. And we call it person-to-person -person persuasion. The reason why when you knock on someone's door, you are not only sharing your messaging points, you are sharing your personal story. And what you do when you share your personal story, it becomes significantly more memorable and more meaningful. And when you're at the polling booth and you look at the candidate's name, you think about the young person or the young in heart that knocked on your door and shared their story. And that will be with you. And what's exceptionally important, why door-to-door -door knocking this year is important, is not only to share your story, your personal story, but the story of our movement, our story of the indivisible movement that this year we cannot stand for, we can no longer stand. Donald Trump and his agenda driven on corruption, driven on authoritarianism, and driven on equality. And that's why we're going to stand up. And that's our story. And it is so memorable. And the thing is, why don't all campaigns do person-to-person -person persuasion? Three reasons. It's very expensive. It requires a lot of training. And it requires lots of people. It takes lots of time. And because of that, a lot of campaigns uh, substitute with mailers, TV, because it's actually cheaper per uh, impression. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a pathway to victory field plan. This is similar field plan that a lot of frontline campaigns would do. And this is to calculate each vote that, it would, uh, that we would need to close the voter deficit and exactly how many doors that need to be knocked. And why we're excited this year, why we're doing this for all 14 congressional districts is number one reason is data. We have reviewed the data for California swing districts and we are telling you it is very promising, especially with the, the turnout that we got from the primary. And we'll say this, if we cannot win the, out of the 24 seats or the 23 seats, if we cannot win California seats or hold on to California seats, we have no business trying to flip seats in Arizona. We have no business trying to flip seats in New Mexico or in Nevada or in Ohio. Wait, because of the 14 congressional districts, three of them have a Democratic voter registration advantage. Another three Democrats are 50-50. And a lot of the districts have a significant Latino voting demographic that is against Donald Trump. And so we believe, Flip the 14 believes, no Republican is safe this year. So in context of how we are going to deploy this is through our field plan. And I think Yes, perfect. And it covers, um, or pathway to victory, it covers five steps. First is understanding voter turnout. Second is being able to get the win number, which is 50% of the voter turnout plus one vote to secure a mathematical victory. Next is the Democratic Performance Index. Uh, fourth is the voter deficit. And finally is the field plan. Tonight I want to demystify what a field plan is. So when you look at any kind of phone banking operation, canvas operation, you'll know that every, every door you knock, every person you call makes a difference. So we start off by understanding the past turnout. So um, for example, in congressional, there's two models. Um, first, there is the past election result model, and second is past uh, Republican performance model. And you wanna get a balance of both. So in Congressional District 22, we have 380,000 registered voters. Uh, in the midterms in 2010, it's 44%. Um, 2014 is 43%. So on the low turnout model side, 
we're expecting about 171,000. And I'm gonna talk about Republicans' performance in just a second. Past Republican performance, looking at Congressional District 4, which is McClintock's district, 440, uh, 34,000 registered voters. McClintock got 186,000 votes in 2010, and McClintock got another 126,000. So on average, we're assuming that uh, Tom McClintock is gonna perform at least around 150,000 at minimum, right? And then so the idea is to be able to get these two mo turnout models and have a balanced approach, including behavioral indicators. And so this is how in the DCCC, this is where it gets political scientific. Um, and we try to have as objective of approach as possible. Step two, once you have the turnout, you want to get 50% plus one. So we're proposing that uh, in November, 193,000 will turn out in Congressional District 22, which is Nunez's district. And 50% plus one is 96,000. In Congressional District 4, we're saying 298,000, 65%. And the win number would be 150,000. And so we're saying 149,000 votes for Jessica Morris, then there's no mathematical victory for Tom McClintock to win. Then step three is the Democratic Performance Index. And this is understanding our base universe, meaning uh, our Democrats that are disciplined, that have voted the last four out of four elections, meaning that we probably don't need to phone call them or knock on their door because they're going to turn out. And so in Congressional District 22, uh, actually I won't read all of it, but the idea is that you subtract the win number from the Democratic Performance Index, and that's how you would get the voter deficit. But uh, the DPI, four out of four here, the DPI for Congressional District 4 being about 80,000. So 80,000 Democrats in Congressional District 4 have voted the last four out of four elections. Okay. So we probably don't need to you know, send them a postcard. We probably want to send the postcard to the Democrats that missed the past elections. Next up, <laughs> step four is the voter deficit, and this is the money. This is what we're looking for. This is the, our number one strategic goal, is subtracting the Democratic Performance Index from the win number, and that's what we get our voter deficit. This is how many votes we need to overcome to be able to guarantee the win number. And so in uh, Congressional District 4, win number again 150, uh, DPI about 85,000, so the voter deficit is 63,483. And so that's the number we want to close. Granted, we're expecting the Morris campaign to run a strong field operation where we believe she'll be able to cut at least 40,000 from the voter deficit. And so the goal is to then close a remaining voter deficit, about 20,000 doors that still need to be knocked, still need to be called. Okay, next step. And now we get into the field plan. Now we understand what our voter deficit is. We want to go into our field plan has two objectives. First objective is voter deficit reduction, closing that voter deficit, and second is voter turnout. Uh, because one, one of the things we've realized is a lot of um, even uh, decline to state voters that you are able to persuade, if they're a low propensity voter, meaning they have a low likelihood of voting, you may have to do a reminder phone call, a reminder uh, door knock when absentee ballots drop. There's two ways of doing voter deficit reduction. One is base voters, and there's two ways of increasing our base voters. One is voter registration, and number two is midterm skipping Democrat engagement. Okay, that was complicated. Engaging the Democrats who have skipped last midterms by getting them to join Indivisible. One thing we've realized is that if they join a group, the likeliness of them voting has increased dramatically. So getting them engaged, getting midterm Democrats engaged. Then second is swing voters, and this is decline to state, high propensity. Um, we're also targeting Republican voters. We're re young Republicans, Republican women from 18 to 34. So we have all the different types of targets of how to close uh, the voter deficit, and we're saying about 25,000. Now we're going into voter turnout plan. Voter turnout, now you've identified your voting universe. You want to focus on the lowest propensity uh, support group and make sure that they rem they're reminded. So that's where a postcard reminder, a text reminder, that's where a Facebook reminder, they all make huge difference. You don't need to knock on their door, right? Because you've already persuaded them. Now you just need to remind them. And that's where a phone call can make a huge difference because you just actually became way more efficient just because you're not persuading, you're just reminding. Have you submitted your ballot? It's, um, 
um, absentee ballots have dropped, right? Do you know where to drop off your ballot? That being a phone call, very helpful. So next step, please. Great, so now we're going into understanding the program metrics. So what we're saying is that in Congressional District 4, we're expecting about 24,000 um, voter deficit. 20, let's just round it up, 25,000. And what we wanted to be able to do is calculate how many doors need to be knocked, right? And so from our internal metrics, from our field programs for the last 15 months, we're about door knocking is about 25% contact rate that they'll open the door. Uh, phone banking is 10%, right? Drops. Texting is actually like 35%, very interesting. So then 72% uh, conversion rate based upon how much training you have, knocking on doors. So we're, uh, just for the sake of this activity, we're gonna say one volunteer knocking about 45 doors on average, 25 to 65 doors, and say each volunteer then equals eight conversions. It means each volunteer that canvasses, you can subtract eight from the voter deficit. And so what, if we do that math, we're talking about 440 volunteers. That sounds like a lot. But if 440 volunteers can canvas for one week, then we have created a mathematical a scenario where Tom McClintock cannot win. So we're talking, yes. <laughs> so we're talking about 440 volunteer shifts for the next five months, right? We are talking about these shifts and each one comes at the voter deficit. And the thing is, a lot of people say, why, um, then why should we phone bank? Well, phone banking is important too, especially early on, because a lot of these congressional districts, especially Congressional District 4, 10 counties, very rural, very hard to canvas. Yeah. When you phone bank first, you help clean the list for the field directors so that they can cut much more productive, high density lists. And that's why phone banking in the beginning makes a huge difference. It supports the campaign dramatically. And so, we, and every wrong number that you get, which, you know, that's the complaint, oh, I just get wrong numbers. You help clean the list so that a, someone doesn't need to knock on that door or call that door or text that number. So every activity that is done really does make a difference. Um, next slide, please. This is a combination of both canvassing and phoning. I put it in the metrics. And the idea is um, phone banking, the conversion rate is a little bit lower. One volunteer instead of eight conversions, it's about four conversions, so it's about half. And so if you split the volunteers, um, half doing phone banking, half doing canvassing, it takes a little bit longer, but it's overall a cheaper program. So if you go back to the last slide, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so each, each how we, the DCCC does a field organizer, pro, I mean a field campaign is by field organizers. Each field organizer manages about 35 volunteers, in charge of 35 volunteer shifts, producing eight conversions. We hire about 12 field organizers managing about 45 volunteer shifts. Field organizer from three to 4,000 a month for the next eight months, oh, we started this, uh, eight, I guess three months ago. Times 12 field organizer was, would be about 336,000. And that's about a frontline campaign. That's kind of what we invested our money in the Garamendi campaign, was volunteer organizers, volunteer teams, building this all out. And this is what we learned in the Obama campaign when I was a field organizer. So um, next slide, please. We'll go into, great, our current programs. So we have six current programs. In, the first is in Congressional District 4. We are working with the Callaway team, we are so grateful for, and the Sacramento Central Labor Council. We are focusing on 25,000 midterm skippers. In Congressional District 4, there are 25,000 Democrats that have skipped midterms. That is our focus. Callaway team has been knocking uh, for the last six months here. We're very impressed. We've been working with them, and um, we've knocked close to 7,000 doors and sent uh, close to 1,600 postcards. So it was great success. Congressional District 22, we are focusing on swing voters. We had, uh, had a call center uh, make close to uh, 10,000 phone calls, focusing on Republican uh, high propensity and uh, decline to state. Congressional District 21, we were focusing on Latino voters. There's about 100,000 Latino voters making up close to 60% of the voting demographic. We had hired Spanish speaking callers, students, Latino students, to make calls in Spanish to Spanish voters. 
Um, it was a great program. And then four, five, six was us making phone calls and texting into these uh, last three congressional districts. Um, for the general election, we'll have similar programs. Right now, we're taking a break. Right now, we're actually not running these programs. We're reformulating to launch programs the final 12 weeks. That's really when the campaign is needs the most amount of people is the last three months. Granted, these two months are incredibly important too. Meetings like today to help energize the base, to provide training, to provide more insight, to fire each other up so that come November or come three months from now, this group has doubled. And that's why what we want to be able to do is go and, and we're so grateful for Indivisible inviting us and to be uh, in both at the Conclave and here uh, joining you to be able to share, like, this is a lot of trade secrets as a political consultant. And for us, um, how we started Flip the 14, it was uh, in the 2017 Women's March. After the Women's March, about 25 political consultants from the Bay Area said, regardless if we get paid, we need to do something. We need to get involved and support the resistance, and AKA Indivisible and Swing Left, but in this case, Indivisible. And for us, we wanna, part of our mandate was to open source some of our trade secrets so that you can, the next five months, we can be a little bit more strategic, we can be coordinated, and also you know that the data is on our side and this movement is very powerful. With that, I think I have one more slide. Oh, perfect. So another part of our strategy, and our strategy is for, um, we have six strategies. The first is having a field organizer in each of the battleground districts. So we are able to do that through our partnership with Code Blue. And so we have 14 uh, field organizers, and their number one job is to form district action councils. And this has been one of the, uh, I'd say, uh, playbook from the Obama campaign. When you, they send you to a battleground state that doesn't have democratic infrastructure that exists or is incomplete, your goal is to form a council or a committee. We call it the Rainbow Coalition. I called every labor union in the region. I called every environmentalist group, every LGBT group, every college group, every Latino group, every in, a special interest group that was passionate about the Obama campaign. And our number one goal was not only to form this council and host weekly or monthly meetings, but to host trainings. And make the trainings uh, break people up geographically. And that's what I wanted to do, but I know it's getting kind of late, so I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to do that. Next time I come, if I were to do a workshop, what I very strongly recommend is to be able to organize within your own regions so that you can host your own house parties. The moment you can host a house party, that's a frontline battle station for us. That means you could start doing phone banking there, and you could be a focal point of export energy. You could phone bank into CD4, you can phone bank from CD7 right from, uh, right from, this, right from this hall. You, you don't have to even be in the district. And so next time we do a workshop, then I can go into to that detail. But the District Action Council has been an important piece of our strategy. Out of the 14, um, 10 of them have District Action Councils. We're still working on the final four. We're very, very happy for the Congressional, I mean the District Action Council in CD4, Callaway team uh, played the leadership role um, with Flip the 14 and the Labor Council to set that up. Um, next is the NorCal Blue Wave Alliance, and um, this is, I think, is another thing that we wanted to kind of bring to everyone's attention. Our goal is to <coughs> coordinate the various groups on, in NorCal to be one, um, I would say, umbrella network where we can communicate regularly. And that's the NorCal Blue Wave. There's a website. We'd love for you to check it out and eventually would love Sacramento Indivisible to be showcased there as well and for us to be able to coordinate. Uh, next is volunteer recruitment. We have had meetings with all of our reps in all of the districts. The number one thing that they're saying is their volunteers are burned out. They don't know if they can do it in, all the way to November. So anything we can do to recruit volunteers here and also, when, especially when the time is right for the last 12 months, for us to reach out to any networks that we have there to help build their infrastructure. Um, and the fifth one goes into our sixth point as well as strategic partnerships, and that's for our field programming. And that's one of the things that I think makes us different from other groups is our number one focus is field. 
person to person persuasion. And one of the things we're gonna be doing this next month is gonna be doing phone banking regarding the family separation issue. And we'll send the links when that's available. But that's the kind of programming that we hope to do and work with the Sacramento Indivisible to do so. Um, I think that covers everything I wanted to talk about. Before I do, before I end, I wanted to do a couple shout outs. So the first shout out is to Callaway team. We're very grateful for their leadership <coughs> in so many ways. I just want to do that. <laughs> and um, so they have canvases on their website, the Callaway team. Um, please check it out. Please sign up. They are canvassing right away because we realize, and their focus is on midterm skippers, which I believe is a, such a critical component to our strategy for our pathway to victory. Um, and I guess lastly, I just want to thank uh, Sacramento Indivisible and thank Nathaniel for inviting me. Uh, I feel one of the things we agreed on in Conclave was that this year is the year for Democrats to be bold yeah. and to take the offensive. And I want to end with um, some words from one of my favorite public servants, uh, Senator Robert Kennedy, who said, the future does not belong to those who are content with today apathetic toward common problems and their fellow brothers and sisters alike, timid and fearful in the face of bold projects and new ideas. Rather, the future belongs to those who can blend passion, reason, and courage in their personal commitment to the great enterprises and ideals of this nation. Thank you.